and the organ. <laughs> Warning in progress. Recording, <laughs> Recording in progress. Okay, it's like warning in progress. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Philip, for the question and for for letting me be around for a little while to tell talk to you guys, guys about some recent work that we're doing in, in my group. Um, I just want to say how tremendously exciting it is. I was just telling Adam this. I think my first time at Stanford in like two years. It used to be pre-pandemic was the was the last time I came down, and it's also the First time I'm really giving a seminar in person again. So it just really feels wonderful and I'm glad that everyone can be here. Good. So um, I'll talk today about uh, some recent work um, that we've been doing um, in two parts. The first part is going to be uh, recent work in collaboration with Katie Nyack, Leon Ballas, and Mike Salico. And part two is some stuff that I'm really excited about and I hope kind of uh, piques the interest of the very broad Two Farm family, in particular. There is really some foundational ideas from theoretical computer science that we borrow in the second piece of the talk, which is work together with my student Francisco Machado, Gustav Trinkao Zhong, and Mike Dalzell Zhong. It just came out on archive two days ago. But for the majority, or, or at least for at least half of the talk, my focal point will be on one thing and one thing only, and that's really introducing, hopefully very, very clearly to you, what exactly is the question surrounding time crystals? And when is that particular question interesting slash non trivial? And especially for those students that first off me on it, I really encourage questions during this, you know, during the entire talk. Um, but just interrupt me, I'm sure, I'm sure that lots of other people have the same question. As a little roadmap, after that, I'll start talking a little bit about you know time crystals in dynamical systems that we don't necessarily think about a lot as physical many body systems. And I'll describe the case of dynamical map systems. In particular, a map called a logistic map. And then I'll sort of move on to a little bit of a discussion of what exactly the challenge of realizing this notion of time crystals is in more physical systems, more physical many body systems. And then we'll sort of move on to the mantra, which I think is the correct mantra for thinking about this particular field, which is that whenever one can't delay or break their ubiquity, which is something we're defining, there will be time crystals. And we'll analyze this intuition in the specific case of some type of dynamical class called floating lens or something. But to start off, um, again, it's emphasized by Philip that the that the crowd is particularly broad. So I apologize for the physicists in the audience who already know this language, but I want to really make sure that we have a very, very common language to start off. And in particular, we're going to be thinking about time crystals as novel, non-equilibrium phases of matter. So I want to use the language of statistical mechanics to really say what exactly is the defining feature of a phase of matter. And in particular, throughout this talk, we'll often be talking about a very specific concept, which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And it turns out within the statistical mechanical formulation of phases of matter, this idea of a phase of matter is intimately connected to this notion of the breaking of some symmetry. And I want to illustrate just you know, to get a feeling in our bones for why that's the case. I want to do that with some uh, with a phase diagram that I think you're all extremely familiar with, which is the pressure temperature phase diagram of water. Oftentimes, I think we're used to thinking about the notion of phase of matter defined by the fact that there are transitions from one phase to a different phase. Instead of talking about like the properties of the phase of matter, we're often used to thinking about, well, okay, the definition of a phase is that in order to get to something else, we have to make a change. There has to be a jump of some sort. And for example, in this phase diagram, you can see that if we wanted to go from the solid form of water to the gas form of water, we can go through a phase transition, crossing this black line over here. And similarly, if we wanted to go from the liquid form of water to the gas form of water, we also cross a phase transition. So within this sort of notion of thinking about phases defined by the fact that there are transitions out of it, it looks like all three of these things seem very equivalent. But it turns out at the top right corner of this, one gets a little glimpse into the dissimilarity between some of these phases, and which will sort of motivate the importance of this notion of symmetry in the first place, which is that it turns out that one can actually walk across the phase diagram from the liquid to gas phase without going through a phase transition if one takes the appropriate path in pressure temperature space. And I want to make this particular point even more clear. And even more distinct by sort of drawing the same nominal phase diagram, but thinking about it, um, thinking about it more specifically in terms of these three distinct things. So again, 
I'm thinking about two phases of the same system of interacting particles, and my y and x axes are still pressure and temperature. And I claim that, in fact, the statement that we saw in the last slide, which is that going from a solid to a gas you have this constant phase transition, is generic. That if you have a phase diagram that has solids and gases in it, you will always have to cross some phase transition to get out of the solid into the gas phase. But that if you have a liquid and a gas, that what we saw last time was also generic, that there will generally be a way to cross some complicated phase diagram by walking through the landscape of that phase diagram and going directly from one to the other without a jump at any. And it turns out the way to understand this particular dynamic or this particular dichotomy is really in terms of the language of symmetry. And I want to explain why that's important. So let me first define what we think about, what we mean when we think about the notion that a particular system has a symmetry in the first place. We mean that the static and dynamic properties of the system are described by some set of equations of motion. Oftentimes, for the remainder of this talk, I'll be thinking about the Hamiltonian as the defining thing for that set of equations of motion. But however you want to think about it, Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, whatever you like. There's some set of equations of motion that govern the dynamics and static properties of the system of interacting particles. And when we say that that particular system of equations, the Hamiltonian, has some symmetry, we really mean intuitively that there's some transformation that keeps those equations the same. So the laws that, uh, that govern that particular system that the equation of motion don't change under a particular transformation, the Hamiltonian is invariant. In the context of solids and liquids uh, and gases, the natural transformation that we think about here is something called translation symmetry. And it simply comes from the fact that, you know, moving your particles a little bit in space, translating a little bit in space, doesn't change the nature of the interactions between them, doesn't change the Hamiltonian, so there is a spatial translation symmetry that the Hamiltonian often exhibits. And the intuition is that when we talk about uh, the role of symmetry for defining phases, is that the state of this particular system of particles, oftentimes, due to the temperature atmosphere, oftentimes as we cool it down, it's possible that the state exhibits a symmetry which is smaller than the symmetry group of the underlying equations of motion that govern that state. And that's precisely this notion of symmetry breakdown. So in the context of a solid, we might say that when we have atoms, if they're in a gas state, the equations of motion are invariant under any small epsilon transition. But as we pull down the system, once we form a solid, the order parameter that describes the fact that they have formed a solid and they have broken the symmetry of the translation is if I look at the local density of particles, it's now no longer invariant under arbitrarily small spatial translation. So there's an atom that's separated from another atom by a lattice translation. The solid here now has a discretized version of that translation symmetry, and this notion of symmetry breaking is precisely one way to understand why there has to be a sharp transition between the solid and the gas. So I just wanted to make sure we're on, because I know maybe it's familiar to many people, but I want to make sure that the language of symmetry breaking is clear and that this kind of intuitive connection between why symmetries are important for defining phases of matter is also clear from the So it turns out that we can now kind of start zooming in on the question that's relevant in the time crystal setting. So the original setting was something proposed by Frank Rochek and Al Shapir almost 10 years ago. And they asked the exact same question we were asking just now in the context of solid state equation spatial translation symmetry. But they asked it in the context of whether or not you could have a time translation symmetry broken. Right? And the analogous idea is that if you have a set of equations of motion governing a Hamiltonian, described by a Hamiltonian, and we said those equations of motion don't change in space, that's a spatial translation symmetry. And if you have a time-independent Hamiltonian, so a Hamiltonian that does not change in time, then there's also a time translation symmetry. The equations of motion that govern that system are invariant under translations by arbitrarily small movements of time. And what does it mean to break that symmetry? Well, the idea at some level is if we now lower the temperature of the system, again, in direct analogy to the previous slide, if we lower the temperature of the system and we get to the ground state, we can ask ourselves, does this ground state exhibit less time translation symmetry than the original Hamiltonian? How would it do that? One possible way is that if you measure a local property of the system, in this case, an observable O, as a function of time, even though the Hamiltonian is time independent, it is possible that the operator, the measurement that you make, 
time dependent, for example, it oscillates in a cycle back and forth. So in this case, that particular observable of the system breaks time translation symmetry of the underlying Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian equations of motion are independent of time. But the observable that you're measuring only comes back to itself some theory of t, then you've broken that particular symmetry to a subgroup of the original Hamiltonian. It turns out that for any one of them, I'm in the quantum setting at the moment, but for anyone who's sort of, you know, taken just under, you know, first couple lectures of quantum mechanics, we know that uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, for example, the ground state, evolve in a particular simple way under the dynamics of Schrodinger's equation, and they simply take up a phase. So it turns out that this naive definition of something that looks like a breaking of time translation symmetry just can't have to do with the definition of how things fall. But Frank and Al were asking a slightly uh, more subtle question, which is they were thinking about two point correlation functions and asking whether two point correlation functions could, for example, exhibit oscillation in either the ground state or in a thermal state given by e to the minus theta h. And a lot of people, I think, maybe already have this gut feeling at the moment, which is that this kind of weirdly awfully feels a lot like perpetual motion. If your equations of motion, you're not doing anything to the system. Right? If your Hamiltonian is just unchanged, it's evolving under its own dynamical equations of motion, yet something's oscillating. And when you think about oscillations like a windmill, you might naturally think, well, shouldn't I be able to like, you know, put a little wire on that and get work out of those oscillations in some way? So it feels a little bit like there's some sort of, you know, second law of thermodynamics being sort of messed up here. And it turns out this was also, uh, a lot of people had this feeling, and Patrick Bruno, Nozier, the number of people put forth kind of contentions in various systems that said such behavior is likely not, um, not easy to have. And it sort of culminated in some really pretty work uh, coming out of uh, Berkeley in Tokyo by Haruki Watanabe and Masaki Yoshikawa, which explicitly proved a sort of no-go theorem that in an equilibrium system like this, where the Hamiltonian is fundamentally time independent, one cannot get oscillations like this in correlation functions of this. So we have to change the question slightly to be able to get a non-trivial answer. So the natural question that people started to think about at that time, including um, a number of folks, is that maybe equilibrium is simply too restricted. So we started with a time independent Hamiltonian in an equilibrium system, maybe that's too restricted. But if you allow for the full kind of you know whole beast that is non-equilibrium in many body physics, that you know, basically encompasses everything. It also is kind of very broad and hard to analyze. So people start to analyze a slightly simpler, a non-equilibrium situation, but one that's kind of the most mildly non-equilibrium system that one can kind of imagine. And the simplest way to take a physical system out of equilibrium, well, one of the simplest is to simply periodically drive the system. And this means that the Hamiltonian is no longer time independent. There is T dependence, but it's a very mild form of T dependence in the sense that the equations of motion cycle back to themselves. So the Hamiltonian cycles back to itself every period capital T. So this was the setting. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a setting considered by Professor Kimani and a number of other people, as well as um, Dominic Elsdale of Bauer and Kate Meyer. And so the question now has zoomed in just slightly from the original question that we just asked in the previous slide. So this is really important. Now the question is, is it possible to spontaneously break time translation symmetry in a periodically driven system? And again, let's think about the same nature of this symmetry, this periodically driven system. Previously, we said that if there was a time axis, that arbitrarily small translations are allowed in terms of symmetry because the Hamiltonian is just time independent. But now, since the Hamiltonian only comes back to itself every t, the symmetry of the system of the underlying equations of motion is that they come back to themselves at t, at 2t, at 3t, at 4t. So it almost looks like the natural question is, isn't the kind of symmetry that we were originally talking about, this notion of the time, isn't that already broken by the way we're actually evolving the system in the first place? It turns out the way to think about this is actually that instead of asking generically about the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry, we're asking about the spontaneous breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry. And again, I just want to use a very, very quick analogy to space to make sure that it's sort of very clear what the idea is. So in spatial symmetries, it's very oftentimes that we have material systems, for example, where the underlying atoms form a non-trivial lattice. 
So I think of my favorite example here called the Kaiume lattice. And you might imagine that the atoms are arranged in some discrete spatial structure. So they already form a potential that is discretized in space. And you might ask, the system of interest might be the nature of electrons that live on this lattice. And they see this potential, for example, that is already discretized in nature. But the state of this particular system, it turns out, can crystallize or form what's known as a density wave pattern on top of the already discretized symmetry. And for example, form an ordered lattice like this. In this case, we say that the system has also broken the symmetry, despite the fact that the original lattice already broke the continuous spatial translation symmetry down to a discrete symmetry, in the sense that the particles themselves are only able to be translated by these vectors that are larger than the direct lines. So it's the same idea of symmetry breaking, but now we're just breaking down a discrete symmetry to a further discretized symmetry. So we have a one d lattice over here, so I just want to emphasize one more time that you can imagine a periodic potential in one d, where you ask, for example, where particles want to sit, and if the particles were evenly spread over here, we would say that they satisfy the discrete spatial translation symmetry of the lattice. But if they form a density wave pattern on top of that, then we would say that the system spontaneously breaks the discrete spatial translation symmetry of this underlying. Okay. Is that clear? So the analogy in time is super clear now that if you want to think about the breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry, the idea would be to ask whether or not the state of the physical system that is being periodically driven, if you measure a non-trivial, some local observable, whether that observable now again further breaks the already discretized space time translation symmetry. For example, in this case, instead of oscillating back and forth with a period T, it oscillates back and forth with a period 2T. So this period doubling or tupling of the period is synonymous with the fact that there is a subharmonic oscillation, the inverse of the two. And that kind of is you know, one of the central, perhaps the most defining phenomenological feature of, um, of this idea of breaking down a discrete time translation. So we zoomed in the question a little bit more. And the question is now, instead of the original version that Frank was thinking about, the question is, in a periodically driven system, is it possible to have observable which exhibit a subharmonic response? Meaning, you take a system, and can you get oscillations at some fraction of the original drive frequency? And if the gut reaction that you had in the very beginning were basically, well, perpetual motion, perhaps the gut reaction you have now is oscillations, even subharmonic ones are kind of everywhere. So oftentimes, at this point in the talk, my hands go up, and I hear people ask, but Norm, why is blank not a time crystal? I've answered the question. <laughs> so um, it turns out one has to zoom in just a little bit further to get a non-trivial question with non-trivial answers. And as I said, you know, we talked about what exactly the phenomenon of spontaneous breaking of symmetry is. And the very first slide I emphasize that the phenomenon is oftentimes we think of it as being symptomatic of defined space and time. So it turns out that we can ask ourselves now. When is it proper to think about the breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry in a periodically driven many body system and leading to something that we could legitimately call a time crystal phase of matter or a time density wave phase of matter? And it turns out that in addition to having this um, observable exhibit self harmonic oscillation, one might naturally want a number of other ingredients. The first and kind of very obvious one is that in general, to define phase of matter, one likes to have a well defined thermodynamic limit. We usually don't talk about phases of matter for few particle systems, you know, one body systems, but we talk about phase of matter as some sort of collective phenomenon. So we would like there to be a set of local degrees of freedom. And with an update rule, in this case, I'm thinking about just the, the, the rule, the dynamical equation of motion that generates time updates of the system. That arises from interactions that couple locally in that particular set of degrees of freedom. We would like there to be discrete time translation symmetry vision. We just defined this in the previous slide. And perhaps the most important thing is that we'd like there to be a well defined notion of the phase of matter being frequent. We don't want to think about the phase of matter as a fine tuned point where if you perturb the system a little bit, this phase of matter is no longer stable with its perturbations. And in particular, we would like the behavior 
this existence of a subharmonic oscillation to be robust to small locality preserving perturbation of both the state and the dynamical update rule. In this case, for example, modifying the time dependent harmonic domain a little bit by drop h. Okay. So we've zoomed in on the question just a little bit further. We started out with this idea of continuous time translation symmetry breaking. Then we gave one to the idea of discrete time translation symmetry breaking. And then we augmented that discrete time translation symmetry breaking with a couple of extra ingredients to legitimately think about the system, the metabolic system, as having some well defined notion of okay. So it turns out that even with these restrictions, the question is still not necessarily subtle enough and it's not precisely the sort of modern landscape where people are asking this question. In particular, even with these types of ingredients and these types of constraints, one might naturally, especially if you come from the dynamical systems literature, one might naturally say that, well, there are time crystals from long ago. And in particular, I'm going to give a particular example of this type of, uh, this type of a construction, something called the broad class of dynamical systems that goes under the name of a logistic map. And you might remember, for those of you that are familiar with the field, that the moniker that's often associated with logistic map is that it exhibits a particular phenomenon called a period double Gaussian chaos. You can kind of forget the word Gaussian chaos for a second, but this period doubling will be important to define the notion of a time crystal in this particular system. So, what is a logistic map? There are many different versions. This is the one I know best. It's a dynamical system that's characterized by some iterative map. So, in this case, you have a single degree of freedom, a variable x where the update rule to take x from time step t to time step t plus one is apply the map phi. And to go from time step t plus one to t plus two is going to apply the map phi again. And I think about this literally as a discrete time update rule, much like you would think about the example of the periodically driven system. There is some, in the case of a Hamiltonian that's quantum, unitary transformation that moves you through one full period of the dynamics. And you should think about that as precisely being this dynamical map phi. In this case, I'm taking a very simple example. Phi of x equals rx times one minus x. And it turns out, as you can kind of already see here, for an appropriate choice of r, there exists a finite volume of initial states which exhibit period double oscillation between two fixed points of the logistic map that you can see here. It's a very, very simple example that has almost all of the phenomenology that we were talking about thus far. The rule is apply phi every time t. This means that the rule itself has a period that's given by t. But it turns out that if you're at the appropriate set of r's, you'll find that what that happens is the system sort of hops back and forth between these two bases of attraction, so that it only returns back to itself every 2t. So it exhibits period doubling under a discrete time update rule given by this map phi. Seems at leading order to satisfy almost all of the uh, almost all of the ingredients that we talked about. Certainly, there is a subharmonic oscillation. It's period double. And rigidity is governed by the fact that, as I mentioned, there's a finite volume of initial states where this happens. So you can return to the initial state a little bit, you can change R a little bit, and you'll still get the same behavior. One might quibble that uh, it doesn't look like this is a very many body setting because we have a dynamical system on a single degree of freedom. But it turns out that one can easily elevate this to thinking about a set of coupled logistic maps. And there's a really rich field in the nonlinear dynamics literature called uh, coupled map lattices, which precisely look at these types of dynamical maps that couple together in sort of finite dimensional systems. And in this case, uh, there's a really, really nice review article by Kunik Neko that has um, some examples of this. Here, I think, is a period four effectively. Um, time crystal that exists in a one dimensional coupled logistic map class. So, again, it looks like we have to zoom in just slightly further to make this map non trivial. At some level, given all of the ingredients that we have thus far stable, rigid, many body, discrete time translation symmetry breaking, at least in the context of these types of dynamical maps, have also been known for a very, very long time. We still have not zoomed in to answer the right question. And the moral of the story that I want to get to in this first piece of the talk is precisely that the challenge, non-trivialness, difficulty of breaking a discrete time translation symmetry truly depends on the class of dynamical systems that you consider. And in particular, 
that dynamic resistance that we were just looking at, the logistic map, is not a particularly natural dynamic resistance that we usually consider as being physically descriptive of nature. So it turns out that, again, still restricting itself to periodically driving, for a periodically driven physical system where the dynamics are measure preserving in quotes here, it turns out answering this question is much, much more solid. And I just want to emphasize for the expert AI that measure preserving is something we often think about in the context of classical Hamiltonian systems with closed system dynamics. For those of you that are taking, I guess, advanced undergrad classical mechanics, there's this idea of Louisville's theorem which tells you that the volume of phase space gets conserved under Hamiltonian dynamics. And that's precisely what I want you to think about with measure preserving. It's also the analogous idea for a quantum flow system, which is evolving unitarily under its own dynamics. The two examples over here are more open system dynamics, and that will actually be the focal point of, of the, the latter half of this talk. And an open system dynamics, the, the name measure preserving is not quite right. There's not really a measure to preserve exactly because has this help into a path. But really, um, for the expert in the audience, the, the way to think about measure preserving in these you know, open classical systems governed by Langevin dynamics or open quantum systems governed by Lindblatian dynamics is that you want there to be a well defined notion of local detailed balance, which means that there, for, at every instant in time, for those of you that need statnet, the system satisfies a well defined version of fluctuation dissipation. And it turns out the reason why the logistic map has a very, very easy way to get period doubling that's stable is that it doesn't belong to any of these dynamical systems that kind of govern physical degrees of freedom. And instead, you can think about the logistic map as an example of a dynamic class which doesn't measure preserve. It specifically is a, a, a type of dynamic called contractive dynamics, where even if you started with a finite volume of phase space as your initial state, under time evolution of that map phi, it would go to a single point of phase space, hence the word contractive. And you can think about it at some level as a limiting case of Langevin dynamics, where you have dissipation, but no noise. You're coupled strictly to a zero temperature back set. And the idea is that kind of that zero temperature back allows you to stabilize. And the reason it allows you to stabilize is because it damps away any perturbation. So the essence of the time principle is somehow that you need to get these periodic doubled oscillations that are rigid. And as long as you can damp away oscillations with a t equals zero back, that's not so hard to do. So one can now uh, zoom in a little bit further to this particular context that we have here, which is periodically driven physical systems. And let's focus on the closed question first. We can ask ourselves, okay, so now we've zoomed into the question of interest. Why has no one thought about periodically driven phases of matter in the last century? What exactly makes this like a modern research topic? And I think, especially because it's always good to ask why the particular question you're asking now is, you know, what, what has led to that question being able or particularly interesting to ask in this context? So it turns out the answer is very simple, and it's some intuition that you already have. That if you have a bunch of interacting particles, um, aka you're in the many body physics realm and you periodically shape them, you periodically drive the system, you periodically shape their equations of motion, you're doing work on the system, and eventually this system of interacting particles will absorb heat from the driving field and it will slowly heat up, sometimes quick, sometimes slow, but eventually whatever order you imagine seeing in that particular system, as the system absorbs energy from the drive, you melt that order and you heat up to a decrease into the temperature. That's the very, very simple obstruction for why it's not super natural to think about periodically driven phases of matter because you want them to have thermodynamic stability. But in the system, if you're always heating up, you cannot get that infinite time, late time thermodynamic stability. Okay? It turns out that more generally, this is kind of a symptom of something uh, in the context of dynamical systems known as ergodicity. And in the specific context of driven systems, ergodicity is really. Um, exemplified by the fact that these many body driven systems heat up and mix. And so the mantra for the, really how I think about the field is that wherever there is a way to break ergodicity in a many body system or to delay the onset of ergodicity in a many body system, there will be time principles. And just to hammer that point home a little bit, what I'm showing here are, you know, we won't go through the table in detail, but there's a number of different ways that people have in different systems to break or delay the onset of ergodicity. 
And in some sense, each of these leads to a different version of time system order with a different type of stability and a different type of physical system that naturally would get formed. So what I want to do in the next couple slides is just to go through highlighting a couple of sort of really nice recent results from various groups to go through a couple of examples that give you a feeling of how one can break area to city, and then sort of we'll zoom into the specific question that we're asking. Something happened. Um, oh, no. It says, are you sure you want to shut down your computer? Cancel. <laughs> Okay. Man, that was scary. Okay. Usually you just click okay, right? When you see something, you just click okay. So okay, so let's 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 zoom into the particular quantum setting. So let's think about a quantum many body system. And I just want to walk us through a couple of examples of ways to break their unicity. And these are, I think, sort of you know, modern ideas in some sense. So one of the ones that's sort of most well known is an idea called many body localizations. It's perhaps now thought to be a phenomenon that's only really stable in 1D and even then with a number of constraints. But the idea is very pretty. The idea is that if you have a lot of disorder in the system, and there, I mean, think about your local degrees of freedom has had these very different energy scales going from location to location. If you have a lot of disorder in the system, that leads to a phenomenon sometimes called many body localization, which means that effectively, it's very difficult for energy and heat to transport from one part of the system to another part. And this is precisely why when you periodically shake such a system, it's very difficult for that system to absorb energy because once it absorbs a single phonon worth of energy, it's hard to redistribute that phonon worth of energy over the entire system. So in this context of periodic driving, many body localization when it's stable can prevent the system from heating up. And there's some really nice um, recent experiments from both Delft and uh, Google Quantum AI in collaboration with Datacast Group um, on looking at the physics of such a many body localized time system. A second strategy, which doesn't allow me to formally break ergodicity, but allows one to delay ergodicity for extremely parametrically long time scales, is something known as free thermalization. And the issue here is again very, very simple. That if you take the frequency of your periodically shaking, your periodic driving to be sufficiently large, in particular, larger than J, the local energy scales of your quantum many body system, then in order to absorb a phonon worth of energy from the drive, there have to be many local rearrangements of the system in order to do that. And generally, this existence of many local arrangements happens at nth order in perturbation theory, higher order in perturbation theory, with a very small matrix element. So the time scale for absorbing energy from the drive is extremely long. In particular, once we prove that it's exponentially long in the frequency of the drive divided by the time scale, divided by the local energy scale. And what that means is that for intermediate, a very long intermediate time scale, one can get sort of pre-thermal, almost equilibrium physics. And it's in this pre-thermal regime that one can again see uh, something that looks like time system order. But eventually, as you've seen drawn here, that order will eventually decay at extremely long times because there will inevitably be locally heating or periodically driven heating of that system. Again, some really nice theory work from uh, Dominic Ellis' group, Dominic Ellis and Peyton Nyack's group, as well as uh, an experiment in, in, in trapped ions in Smith and Rose group. A natural question that you might have in this pre-thermal context is, well, if you have, you know, you're really, in this case, you're almost kind of out of time crystal. You have an exponentially long lifetime, and you're just fighting that final heating process. Is it possible to couple such a pre-thermal system to a little bit of a cold bath, such that that cold bath just absorbs away, just dissipates away the little bit of excess heating that you get at late times, such that effectively you can stabilize such pre-thermal, uh, such pre-thermal time system behavior to infinite times? The challenge here, and I think the answer is not exactly known to this question, is that in addition to having uh, dissipation because you couple to the bath. The bath also always back reacts on the system with its inverse. Again, via the fluctuations of the theorem. And whether or not this particular order that you're looking at is stable to that noise is not clear. It's worth some. My focus um, in this talk is to ask exactly the same question, uh, thinking about whether or not one can get uh, period doubling, stable period doubling in these Langevin type systems um, for, uh, for a classical system. So for a classical many-body system where the time evolution is not Schrodinger's equation, but it's rather something like Hamilton's 
And just to literally return to the same plot as last time with the quantum word quantum replaced with classical, I just want to emphasize that there are some strategies that are uniquely quantum, and it turns out there are also strategies that are uniquely classical for breaking up your layer of everything. In the quantum setting, we had many body localization, but as far as we know, this is not a viable strategy classically. In the classical setting, something I'm not going to mention, but which is tremendously powerful for few body classical systems, is something called the KM theorem, the Carnival KM theorem, um, which basically tells me about stability of dynamical systems for perturbation. That we don't think is a, a quantum analog to that. It turns out pre thermalization is an example of stabilizing against this drive induced heating that works in both quantum and classical settings. And what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of this talk is the set question of dissipation, where instead of thinking about sort of a quantum system coupled to a, a particular bat, I'm asked about classical Hamiltonian dynamics of a many body system coupled to Langevin dynamics, aka a finite temperature bat. And the question I'd like to ask is can one get a time crystal? With lifetime that truly goes to infinity, recalling that dissipation always comes to the beginning. And it turns out, just to remind ourselves which of these four cases I'm sitting in for the remainder of the talk, I'm really thinking about this sort of open version of a classical Hamiltonian system. And it turns out I'm going to basically use two strategies. The first strategy is kind of the, the most obvious one when you do physics. See if it works in the sort of simplest physical system that one can imagine, and it will not exactly work. And the second one is to bring out the heavy machinery, and in this case, it can give you some really pretty results in the context of a ballistic cellular automaton. So, the first strategy is really to think about a very simple classical system that you all will feel in your bones immediately. I'm thinking about parametric resonances of a 1D, imagine a 1D array. Of nonlinear oscillators, literally pendulum, that are coupled via spring, and I'm going to periodically drive the pivot point. I'm going to ask about the stability of parametric resonance. We will find, as I promised, that it's not quite a time crystal, but nonetheless, there is actually a very interesting non equilibrium phase transition that you cannot get in a non periodic phase transition. So even here, there's some use to this. Let's be kind of specific about the physical system. So, as I said, periodically driven coupled pendulums with a spring constant between them. So the frequency of the parametric drive is given by omega d, standing for omega drive. Delta is the amplitude of the drive, and there is a coupling between the oscillators represented by the spring here of strength theta. Very simple physical system. And the goal is to understand the stability of period doubled oscillations under Langevin dynamics. So now I'm going to couple the system to a finite temperature back. That finite temperature back involves immediately dissipation, and that dissipation takes the form of a force where this minus eta, you literally think about it as a friction. But in addition to dissipation, we have to have noise. So there's stochastic fluctuations given by C of T, where the autocorrelation time there is precisely related to the temperature capital T of the system, of the back time. So before going to this one dimensional case, I want to start first to give you some intuition for the single pendulum case. Which has been studied for a couple hundred years. So, the single parametrically driven pendulum, zero dimensional version of the problem. And let's zoom in even further to the case that I said was sort of maybe not the most interesting case, but the one that's very easy to analyze, which is the situation where it is coupled to a bat at zero temperature. At zero temperature, there exists since Faraday, you know, this is, you know Arnold Tongues, you know. Uh, there's this a very well known phenomenon, which is that a force pendulum can exhibit parametric resonances, aka oscillations, at a fraction of the driving frequency. So, literally, a simple implementation of Mathematica you're driving the pendulum at some frequency, but it responds, for example, at twice the period of that frequency. If you literally look at the state of the oscillator and you let time of all fours, it goes back and forth blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. It turns out that um, for the purposes of the talk, I'm going to, it's much easier to look at solid color. So I'm going to take a stroboscopic viewpoint. So whenever you see solid color like this, this corresponds to the blue pendulum having come back to itself. That will precisely be a time crystal. It turns out that at t equals zero, at zero temperature, there are sharp boundaries between the regions with and without self harmonic response. There are phase transitions between a system, the pendulum, when it behaves 
as if it has a subharmonic response that means both one half and one where it doesn't. And the simplest tuning parameter for us is the ratio of the friction term theta to the ratio of the size of the amplitude of drive increasing to zero delta. And that would be captured by parameter lambda. And you literally run exactly the same dynamics for the single pendulum to solve the equations of motion, Hamilton's equations of motion, the Landron form. Uh, for a large lambda, when there's too much damping, you find that the pendulum just unlocks from whatever the periodic drive is and gets damped down. And here, that basically looks like uh, that looks like dynamics pictorially like this. So solid colors will represent period doubling, and white basically will represent the absence of any period doubling. So solid color time crystal, white not time crystal. Now let's analyze still the single pendulum case, but let's now turn on temperature. It turns out it's also well known forever that whenever you have a finite temperature. What previously were sharp phase transitions from period doubled regions to non period doubled regions, from time crystal to non time crystal, they always blur into processes. And the intuition here is agrees with kind of our physics intuition that in a zero dimensional system, you don't really have enough coordination to have any sharp phase transitions at a finite time. The way we measure that in the system, very simply, is by looking at something that is common in the literature called the velocity order parameter. And the velocity order parameter is simply you look at the response of the position of the pendulum, you take a derivative that pulls out the frequency that it's responding at. And if you thought there was supposed to be a time crystal at frequency omega drive over two, you subtract these two. So velocity order parameter zero is in the period double time crystal phase. And when the velocity is gone zero, you've melted out of the time. And if you do these simulations in a finite temperature scenario where the Langevin and Jack is a finite temperature, you immediately see that there's Kind of a very, very smooth crossover between these two situations of period doubling, no period doubling, there's no sharp distinction, and here would be at you have to be the case. Uh -oh. Presenter input. Let's see, did I get this? Is it okay? Oh, no. Okay, so um, now let's turn to 1D. Now we have a coupled array of pendulums. In 1D at zero temperature, the answer is no. We get one gets very, very similar behavior to the single pendulum case when it has sharp boundaries between period doubled and non period doubled behavior. Oftentimes, now we call this behavior subharmonic entrainment as opposed to the period doubling. When we ask the question now, what happens at finite temperature? Now, what I have here is uh, you can see this is a much more coarseness. I have a couple thousand oscillators in this dimension along the x-axis, but time is still evolving in this direction down. So it turns out at low values at this parameter lambda, which is the damping to the driving amplitude, one sees the time crystal, at high values of it, one sees the time crystal melts into a trivial phase. And the question one can ask is, is there anything sharp for a 1D system at finite temperature? The answer, if one's in the language in the, in the context of equilibrium statistical mechanics, is that any sharp phase transition is impossible in one field time. And so it turns out if we look at high temperature, that particular intuition is indeed borne out that for a one dimensional coupled pendulum system at high temperature, it indeed looks like the velocity order parameter just smoothly crosses over between the time crystal and non time crystal. But at low temperatures, it looks like there's a hysteresis loop depending on how fast you sweep this parameter lambda. And in particular, it looks like there is a sharp phase boundary emerging at low temperatures between the time crystal phase and the non time crystal phase. If one can track that a little bit more carefully, if one looks, for example, in um, at a parameter regime lambda in the non time crystal phase, and one sets up a domain wall between the trivial phase and the time crystal. One finds that that domain wall always gets eaten up by the trivial phase. So you, the steady state, the only steady state fixed point is the system is the system in the non-time crystal phase. And if you now zoom in for values of the lambda that are very very close to the putative phase transition, it turns out that if you're just a little bit to the left of the phase transition, you set the same domain wall. The time crystal always wins. If you're a little bit to the right of it, the trivial phase always wins. But if you're very, very close to the phase transition, you can tune this better and better. You find that there's competition between these two phases for an extremely long time scale. And in fact, 
you can see as a function of time that indeed it does look like there is a sharp phase down reemerging. And we think that the phase diagram of the system is actually very similar at some level to the, uh, to the phase diagram that, that we saw in, in slide one. But there is a part of the phase diagram which kind of looks like we have period doubled oscillations, where there is a transition to the non period doubled oscillation phase. And that's the non equilibrium phase transition we just saw. It's not allowed in equilibrium. It's something that's sort of unique to a periodically driven system. But even in this parameter regime where you think that we have period doubled oscillations, if you measure for long times, it does not look to lack stability. It looks like it's an activated behavior which depends on the temperature of the vacuum. So it is almost a time crystal where there's an exponential lifetime, but that lifetime, unlike the pre thermal case, which is controlled by frequency over local energy scale, is controlled by a barrier set by uh, the parameters of the system to divide by temperature. So, as promised, we have a very interesting interacting driven non equilibrium phase transition, but the lifetime does not give me a true time crystal. So the question one to ask now is, is it possible to get a little bit more fancy? We literally did the most obvious thing in a classical system. It's a 1D array of coupled nonlinear oscillators. And so can we change that particular system and make it a little bit more intriguing and get this T to go to infinity? But we still want to be in the physical dynamical setup of being a Hamiltonian and Lambda. So I'm going to take a slight aside. And I'm going to tell you a truthful story that there are time crystals in probabilistic cellular automata, but probabilistic cellular automata are not Hamiltonian plus Langevin dynamics. So this doesn't actually answer the question that we're getting at, but let me at least show you that they exist in this system, and then I'll try to translate them onto the system. We're going to borrow some insight from this field of probabilistic cellular automata, and in particular, I can more or less prove to you that time crystals with arbitrarily with, 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 a, with a lifetime going to infinity, where it works for all initial states, exist in these probabilistic cellular common systems and any dimension d greater than zero. So 1d, 2d, 3d, any higher. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with cellular automata, but let me just, uh, at a very simple level, introduce. Imagine you know, a set of cells, discrete state space with a transition. And the transition rule basically takes you from a particular configuration sigma prime of these cells, whether they're white or black, to another configuration sigma prime. Okay? And so the cellular automata you could think about as a discrete time process that satisfies a particular rule. And before going to it, at least I want to explain to you that there is a connection that I'm not sort of know, but there is a connection to this Langevin dynamics that I talked about in the sort of physical system context. And the intuitive connection can be thought of as the following. But the Langevin dynamics that we were just looking at in the context of these periodically driven um, 1D oscillators are an example of a continuous time Markov process. You have probability distribution of the positions, momentum of the oscillators, and this Langevin operator, a Lindblad operator, basically tells me how I update that in a continuous time fashion. And at some level, you can think about, uh, but we've always been sort of interested in the periodically driven version of Langevin dynamics, where we now think about there being a discrete time process. And the analogous construct in the cellular automata is precisely this discrete time Markov process, which does almost the same thing, governed by a cellular automata transition rule matrix M. But one key difference is that Langevin dynamics come with noise, and cellular automata are deterministic. So in order to get the sort of essence of these fluctuations from Langevin dynamics, the analogous construct in this kind of discrete time Markov is thinking about something called a probabilistic cellular automata. Very simple. It literally take what your original cellular automata rule was, and at, with some probability of an error, you just don't follow that rule, and you do something else. Okay. So physically, you should think about the errors there as precisely kind of this probabilistic nature of the now we go back to the mantra that we had at the very beginning, which is where there is ergodicity, where can there will be time crystals. And I want to sort of really bring that home for us. So I said that for time crystals, you have to have ergodicity breaking. One simple way to understand this is that you need to know whether or not you were sort of going up, down, up, down, or down, up, down, up, like which orbit of this particular cycle you're in. And it turns out that there are just I mean, really just, just beautiful results um, from theoretical computer science. In the context of this probabilistic cellular automata, and these systems are well known to support ergodicity breaking without any fine tuning. 
because Adam may know more, but the examples that I know come from Andre Tum in the 60s and 70s, and more recently, much more recently. So Andre Tum showed that one can get this in a two-dimensional system, like 2D, like a 2D planar system. And Peter Gotch proved um, that one can also get a PCA with uh, air grid escape rates without finding a 1D, but that happened many years later, like maybe 20 or 30 years later. So what exactly do we mean when we say that PCAs are well-known for agudicity breaking? Let's analyze the two model a little bit. Let me tell you what it is. The two model is very simple. Cellular automata can be in two states, red or blue. The next slide will be purple or yellow, but anyway, red or blue. And it turns out that the rule that governs the update of the cellular automata at cell center here is governed by something called the NEC rule, the Northeast Corner Rule. So it is a majority vote of the cell, cell to the north and the east, as well as this cell, and that basically tells me how I update. And it turns out it's well known and proven by Andre Tum that there, in fact, are two stable distributions of the cellular automata, all blue and all red. The remarkable thing is that and you might think, well, okay, Norm, this feels very much like when I learned in StatNet in a 2D system, there's magnets at prime temperature, right? There's a magnet and there's two states all up and all down. But in the magnet case, you are not stable to the breaking of the original Ising symmetry of the magnet. So if you annoyed that bias view that more likely flip downspin to upspin as opposed to upspin to downspin, you would only have one distribution that would be upspin distribution. In this case, what Andre Chun proved, and this is what we mean without fine tuning, is that it's stable to bias noise. Even if you have a larger likelihood of blue flipping to red, bias noise, there are still two stable distributions all blue and all red. And that's really, really cool. So, a very, very dumb implementation, as you can see, it's written like, you know, be basic. But anyways, uh, so what I'm going to show here is just this happens, that there are two stable distributions. What I'm going to show is that, you know, yellow is one, purple will be the other. And I just want to explain to you how this looks like, you know, I'm going to put a little minority island of purple here and evolve the dynamics under the cellular automata, which is two. And you can immediately see that the way the system gets to the stable distribution is it literally just error corrects. Right? So the way to think about the stability of this therapeutic breaking error correction should be the other way around. Then uh, if it was big purple, middle yellow, then yellow only gets swallowed up. And the simplest way to make a time crystal in this model, we call it the type two model, is simply to apply the rule and then flip all the bits. Right? Sort of a totally trivial time crystal in the sun. So now it's still, you know. Eating out what I'm eating up the, 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 the small minority island, but now you're flipping it so that the system only comes back to itself, the magnetization of the system only comes back to itself every two periods of the whole thing. So, the remarkable thing, perhaps the most remarkable thing, is I'm now going to implement bias noise. So, purple will flip to yellow more likely than yellow will flip to purple. Okay? And I claim that because it's true, the Pi 2 model. Which is the model where I apply Tune's rule in 2D followed by a spin flip, but I now have stochastic errors, so the probabilistic cell automata will still look like a time crystal. And that's true. You'll find that you flip and there are errors form, but the errors correct. And eventually, on average, you get a finite, uh, you get an average expectation value for the magnetization, and that average expectation value flips every single period. So this is an example of a time crystal. That's stable to bias noise works for any initial state in two dimensions and a PCA in a polarized color. But as I said, that's good, uh, but it's not exactly the setting that we wanted to consider in the very first place. So the question is, how exactly can we get back to the physical setting? Is there a natural way to translate from this probabilistic cellular automata to the system that we were considering with the pendulum, the Hamilton's equations for strength and dynamics? And in this case, um, the answer is uh, yes, actually. And in fact, this particular question is a constrained version, a constrained example of a much broader question called the embedding problem, where people ask how it is possible or how to embed or realize a discrete time Markov process via the stroboscopic, periodically driven, or periodically sampled dynamics of a continuous time Markov Monte Carlo chain. Um, and here's a very, very simple example of how we could do it. It's not particularly clever, it's the first one that we came up with. But we imagine that we want to do this anti majority vote that corresponds to the Pi 2 model. And the idea is now upgrade our previous system of pendula so that at each lattice site we have two pendula. 
the two off flavor. So every lab set is two off flavor. We're in a one D system. Two D, you know, every set still is two off flavor. And the idea is that you need to remember the state of your system. So one set of oscillators, the A oscillators, for example, serve as the memory of the system, and the B oscillators implement the update loop. In this case, that's what's here. So the B oscillators, for example, this is one time step going from time step T to time step T plus one. What you do is you have the B interact with the A to implement an update rule associated with this local maturity boat, and then you relax this down, and the next step, basically, you have A implement the same rule on the B part. And ultimately, this allows you to keep the memory and also get the update rule for the cellular clock. And you can ask yourself, so this is a, a reasonable construction, and you can ask yourself, does this work? So we start with the probabilistic cellular atomic I was just showing you, and for a particular error rate in the problem, a particular likelihood of making errors on top of the deterministic CA rule, the two rule, we find that there's a phase transition from period double oscillations to non period double oscillations with very short discontinuous oscillations. And we can run the exact same simulation with a doubled array of 2D oscillators on a 64 by 64 grid with a particular set of parameters for temperature and for potential. And we see that that particular simulation of uh, in, the flow, in the Hamiltonian plus Langevin, the flow key Langevin formalism, gets the transition almost exactly the same. It's identical in the deep in the phases, but near the transition where there are the majority of fluctuation, one has some little bit of a discrepancy. But we think that in principle, we should be able to push that discrepancy to zero as you increase the size of the spinning potential d to be very large. A key question to check in this context, which is very non trivial, and we don't have an infinitely sharp answer for this, is ultimately, does the noise that you get in the finite temperature flow the Langevin dynamics? Does it satisfy the error model originally considered in Andre Chu and Peter Gotch's group? As long as you can prove that it satisfies that, actually, it's there, the, the error models are extremely general. So we think on very general grounds it should be the case. Then it's immediately true that a flow key Langevin simulation of a PCA immediately gives you a flow key Langevin time shift flow that is stable to infinite time independent of initial. So we go through quite a bit of analysis of the fluctuations in this archive paper that we just posted a couple of days ago. But we think on pretty general grounds that it should be satisfied. But formally proving that it is satisfied is very difficult. But we have numerical evidence that it is satisfied um, quite well. Good. Um, let me just end with just with uh, with just one very, very quick statement, which is that you know, today's talk really focused on the situation where one has an open stochastic system where uh, the degrees of freedom are coupled to a finite temperature back, but really that you know, there are many, many different systems and open systems, many different strategies to close and open systems to stabilize or break the organicity. And I do think that this landscape of time shift is extremely broad and that there can really be questions about whether or not one can stabilize this type of subharmonic oscillation in many different, many different physical structures. So let me um, acknowledge my uh, very good friend and collaborator, Mike Salatel, who both of these works are, are done with. The first project was sort of done together with Chayden Nayak and Dion Ballas, and the second was done together with a uh, Berkeley student, Francisco Machado, and a postdoc at the time, Chun Tao, who's now at the University of Arizona. And let me now thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks all for the great talk. Are there any questions? And probably I should mention on Zoom, either unmute and mute yourself or post it in the chat box. Fine. Uh, so uh, in the uh, kind of cellular on top of the version of this, uh, if you're adding bias noise, there is some like inverse exponentially small probability that you flip you know, the whole grid from say purple to yellow, right? Yeah. So so there should be after some exponential amount of time, like the time crystal should um, something should break with them. Yes, yes, exactly. That, that, is there something analogous in your classical? Well, for real quick, let me answer the, 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 the observation is true, but that's an exponential in the system. Yeah. So usually, we think about, as soon as you take the term down, it's like L to infinity, you take that. Oh, uh, okay. So then that's that, just that, suppressed. That, 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 that basically just goes yeah. to zero. So, in the Floki Lantern case, also true mm -hmm. that you should have a time scale. So, when I say infinite, I don't, you know, very good point. You know, in all of the settings where one talks about infinite lifetimes, whether it's MDL or this Floki Lantern setting, it's always equal to L. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think yeah, the super good I'm, I'm sort of always thinking about, I think I think somehow you do, I think, I think at least in the setting that I'm experiencing, you want, I'm always thinking about it in this discrete time update rule, so you kind of want it as zero as drive. And I suspect that, you know, I don't know how to think about this precisely, you may be better than me, but, uh, but imagine the spin flash and you have this frozen configuration. If you somehow could flip each spin, basically, if you could periodically drive the system, and if there's some, I don't exactly know, if there's some aging time scale or some time scale for the lifetime of the flash that's exponential in some barrier heights. Um, so presumably on those time scales, if they're due to the L, then I would say that you have an infinite autocorrelation time. If they're due to some barrier, then I would say you have an exponential time scale. But I do think that as long as this periodic flip is kind of you know happening, that you should you can think of that as an example of a time crystal with a lifetime that's cut off by the lifetime of the spin flash. You just need to have it flow. But I suspect that in such a system that eventually, you know, if there were no other methods, I mean the, the glass I, I often think about, you know, as being there because of disorder. So if there were no mechanism to prevent this the glass from absorbing energy. Eventually, it should absorb energy. So there is some cutoff lifetime, unless you have a glass, I guess, in one view where you have this localized behavior, right? I think of glass as a localization type, not of its event context. But if you have, I guess, this glass behavior in higher dimensions, in 3D, for example, an Ising glass with a strange Kirchhoff model, I suspect that once you drive them, that you should eventually heat up the system. So you would melt that, but it would last for a very long time. And in that time scale, I would totally say it looks like time is Yeah, again, it's very subtle, actually. You know, dissipation does a lot of things for you because you take with the speed, but it also adds this noise. And at least in the simple example, just like one D oscillator chain, that noise kills you. It doesn't allow you to get this infinite autocorrelation time unless you do something fancy, like think about a or Fokker model. So in principle, it's yeah, I don't know the answer, it's just subtle. Sure. So I was wondering in this um, cellular automaton model at the end, whether you thought about what happens if you add sort of add back in quantum mechanics. So for example, when you have the AD system and the system, it's like yeah, I can imagine there's some qubits and you're doing a control case, but now there's a back action, the control or something, it's like what would happen. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so the, 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 the 
super good question. I thought about this quite, 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 quite a lot. So the first thing to say is that, of course, in a quantum system, we can emulate a classical system just by looking at this population dynamic. So we can definitely get in a quantum system this thing, but that would be like the worst use of a quantum computer possible. <laughs> um, but now, now, now what, what Monica asked is, imagine upgrading the Hamiltonian that evolves me in a discrete time step, so like a quantum channel that does it, and imagine upgrading the Langevin dynamics to a Limbladian that does that. And it's not clear to me, because you also have dephasing, the noise also causes dephasing, and it's not actually clear for a truly quantum version of it if your statement is that dephasing. I, I, don't, I don't really have a good answer. So in, when you bring spatial translation symmetry in you know, two or more dimensions, and you get this lattice uh, structure, um, could you get something similar like space-time crystals, where you get a you know, variance under discrete translations in both space and time uh, simultaneously? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, so yes, the answer is yes. So you can imagine, like, you know, take a square lattice and imagine that, you know, you label every other site in, like, a, you know, in, like, a, uh, in like a checkerboard pattern at A and a B site, you can imagine, for example, a, a situation that breaks both spatial and time translation symmetry, where the particles, for example, hop from A to B. They hop from A sub last, B sub last, B sub last, A sub last, so it breaks both types of symmetry. What's not clear to me, so that's, that's definitely possible, but you can ask yourself, is that somehow intrinsically necessary? Like, is there sort of the physics of spatial translation symmetry, and then the time translation symmetry just comes for the ride? Or is that time translation and spatial comes to ride? Is there something where they sort of you know, fundamentally couple together? I think there are now systems in which um, the former is true, where you kind of have the time translation symmetry breaking kind of coming after or sort of you know being implicitly there because of the spatial translation symmetry breaking. But it's not, I just don't know the literature well enough. There are papers that talk about the opposite direction, but it's not really clear to me how to put it. And we also have a question over Zoom. So, um, Frankie asked, um, are there any the free energy based arguments to be made when considering classical non equilibrium crossover phase transition and analogous classical equilibrium functions as a breakdown? That's a super, super good question. So, let me, let me reformulate this question just a tiny bit. Um, so, in a magnet in equilibrium, in a classical magnet in equilibrium at finite temperature, you have, you know, one, let's say you're in the all down state. You have thermal fluctuations. So as Adam said, you can nucleate a little domain of up space. And why does that domain eventually disappear? Because of free energy. It's just, you know, energetically unfavorable for that domain to exist. And as you thermalize, basically that domain disappears. We can ask ourselves, okay, so imagine that in a time crystal, basically, let's take an example of a quantum time crystal, where you start with, you know, all of your spin down, and let's just flip some of the spins to be sort of up like this. Now let's ask, is there a mechanism naturally that under the dynamics of like a localized time crystal that basically some constraint that's like free energy that plays a role in free energy causes my spins to come back? In the context of many body localized energy, you no. Know. What will happen forever is that whenever the up, I don't know, I hope you can see that. The up domain basically, they just keep looping like this. So there is no desire to sort of necessarily define a low energy state relative to a free energy, so you don't need to do that. In the context of the open system Langevin case, there is a mechanism, and that mechanism is not free energy, but it's really the fact that error correction is being implemented by this Bouquet Langevin dynamic by the true rule. And in that error correction is sort of you know what ultimately brings you back to this sort of you know uniform state. So I would say in equilibrium, it's free energy. In MBL time crystal, no constraint that'll just stay like this forever. In the Floquia Langevin case, non equilibrium classical, I think about it there. And for the question. Thanks. One thing about stability in the Hamiltonian case, there's a natural set of perturbations that you consider. In this more general setting, I have noise and dissipation. It is still like clear what is the set of perturbations that you consider to define a phase. Yeah, and any given thermal disaster. Okay, so really, and this is kind of something that I think maybe sort of you know, alluded to, but a really good question is that in the closed system case, you know, when you have periodic driving, you have a symmetry, right? I always talk about things in terms of the symmetry breaking, where you have a symmetry, 
So you can ask, like, you know, I think what's kind of being asked is, you know, well, in that case, you're kind of constrained to the types of perturbations that you have to be rigid to, right? Because if, for example, I allow my drive frequency to wiggle a little bit, I no longer have that symmetry. And if I don't have that symmetry, I can't break that symmetry. So that's true in the closed system case that you have to have, you know, perturbations, for example, that are constrained to respect the periodicity of the drive. It's not weird. I mean, thermal fluctuations don't do that. But in the example of the flow tail energy, then it doesn't matter. Because you're stable to this biased noise in the tune construction, even if you have noise that breaks the underlying time translation symmetry of the drive, you still get period locking like this. And that's basically just because you have the stability to bias noise. So it's kind of a much stronger version of stability in the sense that it really is stable to any local perturbation. Then let's thank Norm again. Hey, I did in the back. Yeah, no, I one of my classes.